Tonight on Reporting Scotland. The UK's highest court rules that two Scottish Catholic midwives must supervise staff who carry out abortions. Yeah, that was after a long legal battle. Mary Duggan and Connie Wood lost their fight not to direct colleagues to be involved in uh, abortion work. Uh, now Mary is supporting a new move to allow health workers to opt out of abortion work. Um, a private bill is being introduced to the House of Lords, uh, which seeks to strengthen conscience rights. Um, it would only apply to England and Wales, but it has been closely watched in, in Scotland and supported by uh, the Catholic Church here. Um, and uh, Mary Duggan joins me now. Good morning. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Kate. Good morning. Um, and also with us, Mary Neal, who's a senior lecturer from the law school at Strathclyde University to explain a little bit more about conscience uh, rights. Uh, good morning to you, Mary. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mary Duggan, can you explain to us exactly what your role was at, at, at that time that, that you took a, uh, exception to? Well, I worked as a senior sister on the Labour Ward at what was the Southern General and uh, Following the amalgamation just shortly before I left, um, it became the Queen Elizabeth um, unit. But anyway, for over 20 years, 25 years, most of that time I was a sister and I worked on the Labour Ward. Uh, we did delegate staff, took responsibility, managed the ward. Um, but we were very actively involved with the actual care of the women. Um, we weren't hands off as maybe some units uh, have managers and sisters who really just delegate and that's it. We were very involved with deliveries that took place in the labour suite. Um, but for all that period of time, uh, I never ever took responsibility for any of the medical terminations, which were very few initially um, at the Southern General for the simple reason that it, there was a lot of consultants who didn't do abortion as well. So there was no strong culture, if you like. There were they, they were maybe between 10 and 15 a year, something like that, that would come to the labour ward. And we're talking then, since 1988, um, the cut-off for coming to the labour suite was 20 weeks. Right. So um, we, we didn't get very many coming to the labour ward and there were other sisters on duty, so they would take responsibility for those. So it was relatively easy to mm -hmm. avoid. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so what, what changed? Changed. Uh, the number of sisters went down big time. You know, they, they cut back a lot on the number of sisters. But also um, it was their interpretation of what we could withdraw from. And it was myself that took it to the managers um, to do something about because there was a, a desire to bring earlier terminations to the labour suite. We're talking about down to 15 weeks. So there would be a lot more coming then. And a number of staff who, I don't know that they were true conscientious objectors, but quite a number of staff would come to me and say, you know, get quite upset because they were dealing with abortion more often. I think for some people, if they have to do it now and again, they can they can handle that but because it was becoming more frequent and we've come into childbirth to um, bring life into the world primarily and deal with people who lose babies but anyway more staff were coming and I was asking the my managers to really do something about this because there were more staff complaining and what was on the cards was this amalgamation whereby um, the Queen Mother's Hospital had the reputation of doing an awful lot more terminations in the labour ward than what we ever did. So I could see the problem looming. Um, I was told there was there could potentially be two to three a day, which sometimes did actually result in that number, uh, which was a huge difference to what we had done before. So that was going to be much more difficult to actually resolve for the managers. And they really didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to know because you're left with a problem rather than it being one that's actually organised and managed properly to accommodate people like myself. Well, but what did you want to happen to the women? Well, you see, that's not my responsibility if I've got conscientious objection. That's the point. It's not my responsibility to work that one out. But that's the, that's the attitude. It's my problem, but it's not my problem. No, um, but I'm interested that you say there were certain staff who, you know, could cope with a certain amount, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but then couldn't, you know, once it got to a level. If you've got a conscientious <coughs> well, objection, that's right, that's then right. there's a principle, isn't yeah, it? And, right. and whether it's one, ten, a yeah, hundred. That's right, yeah. that's your but when you're talking about staff who are coming and complaining because, yeah, I can cope with two or three. Yeah, that's right. But that's I don't want ten or eleven. That's not a conscientious that's objection, right, that's is it? Right, that's right. But that's exactly what I said. I didn't think that they truly had a conscientious objection, but they were voicing concerns but it wasn't just that but it was, then that's a moral judgment yeah well that's theirs not mine 
That's their mm. judgment, it's not mine. That's an interesting discussion, uh, d distinction, Mary Neal, is it not? <clears throat> that you know, between someone who has a true conscientious yeah, uh -huh. objection, as Mary would say, that she has, whether it's one, ten or a hundred, mm -hmm. um, and then people who say, well, actually, it's getting a bit much. I think in terms of numbers, um, I, I would agree with what Mary said, that that isn't true conscientious objection. Mm -hmm. But I think conscientious objection to abortion is complex in the sense that there might be uh, staff members who, object, who would object to some abortion and not to others. And I think that could be a, a genuine conscientious so objection. So what example would you give them? So, for example, there might be a staff member who would object to later abortion but not earlier abortion. So that could be on genuine moral grounds. But what would determine that? Because we have the law, of course, which surrounds abortion. Um, so would that be an individual deciding what their own personal limits were? Well, it, it could be. Um, I think the, the way it seems to operate at the moment is that it's an all or nothing thing. You either object to all abortion or you don't. Um, there are some other uh, jurisdictions in which people are allowed to object partially. So to m maybe to abortion for some reasons or to abortion after a certain uh, time limit. Um, but that's not how it seems to work here. Right. So th this um, private member's bill that's been brought forward to the House of Lords um, what is it proposing? And I know it wouldn't apply to, to yeah. England and Wales, yeah. but apparently there's, a, there's a great deal of... It, only yeah. in England and Wales, yeah. apologies, yes. Uh, so it would not apply in, in Scotland, yeah. although there is a great deal of interest in it. Yeah. So, so what is it proposing? Well, it's, it's basically proposing um, to recalibrate uh, the, the grounds on which people can conscientiously object to abortion. So somebody in the position of Mary Dugan, um, who was indirectly, um, who, who was going to be expected to be involved in the process indirectly, um, isn't protected under the current law as, as interpreted by the Supreme Court in her case. Uh, so the Supreme Court in Mary Dugan and her colleagues' case decided that uh, only those who have direct involvement in the process... And how is that defined? Protection. Well, that was that was defined uh, by the Supreme Court in in that case as as meaning hands on involvement, so involvement in a hands on capacity. And the the court went into quite a lot of detail about uh, about particular scenarios and and what might be covered and not covered. Mm -hmm. I mean, just you know, obviously these are expressions are can, are vague and open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, Mary, from what it was your problem with say meeting women or no. or handling? What, what? No, it was just that I was being told I was morally responsible for this abortion being done. Right. I, you know, I had to make sure that staff went in. If they weren't adequately trained or, you know, they, 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 I could be held responsible for that abortion not getting done or for a problem cropping up. Right. But I would stress that the women, for the duration that myself and Connie would uh, work there, no women would ever know what our views on abortion were. Not one, because we we never alienated anybody who came into the labour suite. It was taking the responsibility for it, right. basically. Okay. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. So if there was, as you say, if, if a problem arose and it was an inexperienced member of staff yeah. and the blue light went on... Yeah, we responded. It, w it would be up to you to yeah. come in. Yeah, yeah we yeah. did. We did. We and did. you would, did yes, you? Yes, absolutely. We did, because you don't know what the, the buzzer's gone for. So we have been caught up in the termination process because there's, no, you know, we have to respond to that. But since there's... So you did in your career oh, find yourself? In absolutely. And absolutely. how was that for you? Well, it's very hard, actually. You know, it's easier to make a stand when it's very black and white, but a lot of the time it was grey areas. You know, like just talking about this, if a buzzer goes off, you know that woman's in the labour ward. If somebody comes up and asks you about them, you have to direct them. But your 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 conscience is telling you that it, from a uh, you know if you stand back from the situation, if you're not working in a labour ward situation or a gynaecology or whatever, it's easy to be black and white about something. But when you're actually in it, as we were often, uh, you know, work in that place, um, it was much more difficult because there were those areas that you just don't ignore a woman if she. She buzzes for something. Um, and we I've been caught up with the deliveries and what have you. Well, tell me a bit more about that because, I mean, we took great interest in this case in 2014 mm -hmm. and um, for, for very understandable reasons, you know, you and Connie didn't want to really right. be speaking publicly mm -hmm. and, you know, I think people can understand that. But it perhaps was seen in a black and white way Absolutely. because we only had yeah. Yeah. Um, what was in front of us. Yeah. So tell us a bit more about that conflict that you would have. Well, you know, I've done work with post-abortive women for a good many years. And the reason I got involved was because stillbirth, caught death, miscarriage, these are all good, if you like, 
griefs that can be dealt with easily. But I was always conscious that women who'd had terminations, and I'm not there to judge them. I'm, I've got friends and people close to me who've had terminations for different reasons. And they know I don't judge them at all. Uh, it's an action I'm taking a judgment on, not the person. However, um, these these uh, I was always conscious that there were people grieving and that couldn't speak. And of course, the big issue about abortion is because a woman has chosen then why is she complaining afterwards? And it's not as simple as that at all. And over the years, um, through the work I did with a group called British Victims of Abortion, um, who have changed the name to um, ARCH, Abortion Recovery Care Helpline, I, I learned so much that helped me in my actual work as a midwife. And eventually I got to a point where I could often assess and, and pick up on women who'd had terminations because of the anxiety levels that they, they demonstrated, which were above average. Not them all, of course, but a good many I could pick out. And I was wanting to help them. That's the point. I wasn't wanting to judge them or, or, or you know, I let them make those judgments, not me. Um, so that was why I got involved with the area. And it's part of the reason why I've pushed on with this whole issue is to show respect to those women who have recognise the terrible harm that it's caused them, which nobody talks about. Why, what, how is that, how, what's your logic there? Why, why is you pressing ahead with this showing respect to those women? Well, it's partly showing respect. It's not completely the story. It's, you know, like I've, I've been aware of the women and, and the, what they've gone through and all the rest. And I think there's another side to this, but that's an area that's not really talked about. That's a part of it. It's not the whole story. The whole the majority of the thing here is my conscience. And by the way, it's mostly Scotland. It's portrayed as a Catholic issue. If I was an atheist, I would still feel the way I do. Mm. You know, like it's reported in other media as two Glasgow midwives. But here in Scotland, it's two Catholic midwives. And I had people coming to me saying... I'm not in any formal um, church or whatever, but I really do object to this. It's nothing to do with that. It's your conscience. Well, I absolutely take your point on that. I think that's a very valid point. But I will ask you, is it because of a religious belief that you have an oh, objection? No, not at all. In mm. fact, I get quite cross when I say, when I hear people saying, um, oh, I can't do that. My, my, my faith doesn't allow me. No, think about it through. I would prefer people who have thought the issue through. And that's why, that's what I've done. And I would encourage others to do as well. Drop the religious thing altogether. So what would you like to see? I would like to see some common sense applied. Now, for over, well, 67, the Act was passed. And I can tell you that if that had been interpreted the way it is now since our court case, many people would have left the, the profession. There's no question about that. It was recognised at the time by David Steele and that the, the point about getting, you know, giving conscience clause because they were aware there were a lot of Irish staff who worked in the health service and they were very concerned that they would lose them. So this gradual change in watering down of what conscience is to the point where many of the senior staff really didn't give much. It was mm. lip service they were applying to. But I'd like common sense to be applied without the need to be actually going heavily political and go back to what the spirit of the law was meant, uh, you know, meant in 1967. Well, wh which is what? I mean, Mary Neil, maybe you can help us on this because, you know, people will not be aware of the law. Mm. Well, well, the, the wording of the, the conscience clause in Section 4 of the 1967 Act uh, just says that no one shall have any obligation to participate in treatment authorised by this Act. So it doesn't go into the distinctions of hands-on or hands-off mm -hmm. or direct or indirect. It just says that no one will be obliged to participate. Um, and participate in Mary's case was interpreted as meaning hands-off, uh, sorry, hands-on or, or direct. But the purpose of a conscience clause is to protect individual professionals um, from having to share a moral responsibility for an outcome that they regard as morally impermissible. Um, now, clearly, if you're directly involved in a process that leads to an outcome, you share moral responsibility for it. But you also share moral responsibility if you enable or support or facilitate a process in indirect or hands-off ways. Um, so a conscience clause that doesn't protect people who might be expected to be supportive or enabling or in an indirect way isn't fulfilling the, the central purpose of a conscience clause. Um... So the, the, the strengthening being suggested down south is what? Well, the, it would be that uh, 
you could you could object to the kind of indirect involvement that is currently uh, not protected following the Supreme Court's judgment in uh, the case of Mary and her colleague. I mean, what was also interesting here, I suppose, is that um, you know the way that termination can be conducted um, is not exclusive to, to labour wards. I mean, we have sure. medical yeah. terminations. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I don't know whether you, you wouldn't view the morning after pill presumably as a, a termination, would you? Potentially. You would potentially? Yeah, yeah. Yep. because that's the aim of it. It's potentially. It's not definite, but it's potentially. Right. Okay, so mm. pharmacists um, who would be responsible for, for giving that, I mean, could, could they also, I mean, who else could be mm -hmm. um, caught up, if you mm. like, not caught up in a conscious mm. clause, but, but ask mm. for that to be applied? Well, leaving the morning after pill issue to one side, because I think that does depend on the science of whether it is terminating something that has begun and I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure if it's... But interestingly, that. Mary says potentially. Mm -hmm. Her potentially. view is potentially, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there will be, a, I suppose, a range of views on that. Um, but pharmacists could find themselves uh, involved in, in termination itself um, because of changes to the way that abortion is, is... or likely changes to the way that abortion is provided in future. Um, so you'll know about the, the Scottish Government's announcement late last year um, about um, allowing women to take the second medication for termination in their own homes. Um, so that's a, that was an announcement that's been widely welcomed across the UK um, and some campaigners uh, see it as a, a desirable first step towards providing early abortion completely at home, both doses of medication. So if that were to, to be uh, pursued, then it could easily uh, be that GPs and pharmacists would have much more involvement in providing termination than than has ever been the case before. So pharmacists and GPs could find themselves GPs could find themselves prescribing um, uh, mifepristone and misoprostol, and pharmacists, community pharmacists, could find themselves dispensing it. Um, and it's far from clear that the current law would protect them if they did consider that the that their moral um, position precluded them from from doing that. Mm. So it's not clear that they would be protected under the, the law as it's currently interpreted. Mm. So I think that's something we do need to look at. I mean, Mary, I, I know you're saying that you're not coming at this from a position of um, judgment and, and judging individuals. Mm -hmm. um, but can you see how some women would see it that way? Some oh, men absolutely. and women would yeah. see it that way, yeah. that, that basically you're saying, I'm not going to be involved, I don't want anything mm. to do with what you are doing because I regard it as morally reprehensible. Mm. Just because I hold this view, that's what people will say. And, and we've seen the things that have been written over the years about us and it was to be expected because people don't understand. But I met up with some ex-colleagues the other day there and um, I haven't seen a few of them for quite a number of years. And there was one person very close to me and she actually went down that path herself for the reasons, you know, she would come to, you know, she'd, I don't want to break confidences or anything like that, but... She embraced me because she knew, and so did her husband, because she knew and she defended me among some colleagues who were critical of our stance because when she found out, I went to see her. And I embraced her and I, was, I felt heart sorry for her, the position she was in. But the reality is, those of us who hold this position, my experience has been that we would give a lot more compassion and help than often people who support and do abortion. And my experience is that sometimes, not them all, but some staff can be quite critical of women. I'm talking probably more on social abortion than, than actual for, for the baby having a handicap. But sometimes I've heard staff say things I would never utter. And they, I think it's because they don't like doing what they do. And so they feel that they can make a stronger judgment. But I am not there to judge a woman. I've discussed this with colleagues and what have you. Um, and those who know me know I'm not judging that woman. Well, let me just give you quickly a chance to respond to just a, a couple of texts that have c come in. Um, two of them. As a healthcare worker, I'm appalled that your guest believes that it's not her problem to look after women with healthcare needs. She has the right not to participate in the procedure, but has a duty of care for women in need of healthcare. These rights are there already. And another one here, the NHS is a fine place to work if you want to help folk, but the wrong job for those who'd pick and choose who to help based on personal choice. Treatments would be subject to even more staff shortage than now, building pressure and other staff work elsewhere is the answer. Well, <laughs> what was the point of the conscience clause? It was recognising that there would be people like myself who find this, this is not good medicine. That's the point of it. And when I say it's not my problem, I'm talking in an, a, an abstract way. As I explained to you, when I see these women and dealing with them, I'm not cold and dispassionate with them. Um, 
but the situation, I'm talking about an objective thing, from the point of view of the health board, it's for the health board to sort out and keep, you know, accommodate ourselves because the, the law actually says that we have a right to protection under conscience. So that's there. So And it was there in 1967 before I came into midwifery. And can I just say one other thing? They talk about the shortage of staff. I know many people over the years who said they've avoided midwifery and obstetrics and gynaecology because of the potential to be involved in terminations. That's a fact of life. There's 3,500 midwives short in the country. And so the people who say um, they care about women... I don't know. I'm not convinced by that because they're not allowing people who, like myself, who want to, to do this job and do it well and care for women. They want them to come in, but they don't want to. The, these people mm. don't want to uh, to come in because they will be forced to do something against well, their conscience. I mean, we can't necessarily yeah. make that link. It's interesting that those stats are there, but we can't necessarily say that there's a shortage of midwives because people don't want to come in because they might be involved in medical uh, in termination. It may be the case, but yeah. I don't think we have the evidence to to establish that at this point. Um, well, thank you very much for coming in. I, I do appreciate it. We, we've got a couple of statements that uh, we are duty bound to read from the Scottish government. Uh, we believe all women should have access to clinically safe and legal abortion within the bounds of the law. Abortion care should be part of standard health care provisions and should be free from stigma. Uh, we have no plans to change the law on abortion. And they say there's a clear provision within the existing abortion legislation which protects the right to conscientious uh, objection. And uh, I would imagine you don't particularly agree with that interpretation. <laughs> um, and the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde say in 2014, um, we NHSGGC as they snappily call themselves uh, was successful in its appeal at the Supreme Court. This legal process is now concluded. Um, we adhere to the Nursery and Midwifery Council's Code on Professional Standards of Practice and Behaviour. This allows midwives and uh, nurses to refuse to participate in terminations of pregnancy except where it is necessary to save the life of a pregnant woman or prevent grave injury to her physical or mental health. This also applies to doctors and GMC and Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists College's recommendations are respected. Um, you will be aware of that position, uh, I'm sure, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much indeed uh, for speaking to us this morning and thanks also to Mary Neal. Um, we're going to catch up with the travel at 10.31. Uh,